Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about the German G41 rifle, uh, Walther's G41 specifically, which is really the G41. We're not going to get into the G41M because I don't have one of those yet, uh, but we're going to be focusing on the G41W, uh, which is the, the far more common. It's the one you're going to run into most often or see online if you're looking. Uh, we're going to go into the history and development of this gun, which is really quite interesting. And thanks to Darren Weaver's new book, uh, Rough Forged, uh, we're going to go into the history behind this gun and kind of correct some of the misinformation that's out there about these. So the two volumes of Rough Forged, uh, they're really fantastic. Um, volume one here really kind of covers um, German semi-autos before, you know, uh, World War II. Um, goes up through, you know, the G41 and kind of covers a little bit of the development of the G43 as uh, volume two really focuses on the G43, all the variations, um, you know, these books cover the accessories, a lot of the history. So there's a lot of stuff you're not going to see in this video um, that is really in these books. So if you're interested at all in these, I highly recommend getting these. They're not that expensive right now. Um, so, you know, get these because, you know, when books like these go out of print, they always shoot up in prices. So uh, don't say I didn't warn you to get these already. So we're going to start off by correcting some of the misinformation that's just been regurgitated. And I'm guilty of this. I've said it in past videos. I hear it in a lot of other people's videos. And I just need to start off by saying it because we need to correct this going forward. Um, the G41 rifle series is not like a 1941 program. Just because of the nomenclature G41, a lot of people assume that in 1941, the Germans decided, oh man, they, they saw the, you know, the M1 rifle and the SVT and it was, it was reactionary. They think the, uh, you know, the G41 rifle was reactionary. And in fact, it, the, the designs go back before the war. The request goes back even before World War II. Uh, I mean, Mauser was working on their G41M and like they had pre-production models in like 1938, 1939. Uh, Walther was working on what would become their G41 as well in like 1938. They patented, Walther patented their gas system uh, in 1939, early 1939. So it was probably finished in like 1938 as well. So, I mean, you know, Walther Mauser, some other firms, they're working really hard on getting a semi-automatic rifle developed before World War II. So this is not a reactionary measure so much like a wartime, oh my gosh, we need this, as it was just, they knew it was a thing, they knew semi-auto rifles existed. I mean, the Germans had semi-automatic rifles back in World War I, you know, in small numbers. Um, so it, it, this isn't a completely new concept to them. So it's in 1938 when Mauser and Walther, they both have prototype rifles that they think are good enough to go ahead and submit for trials and evaluation. Um, so that's around this time, there's no documentation on exactly what the requirements were and exactly when the requirements were given. Um, but it's probably around the same, you know, 1938 time frame. Um, now these four requirements were pretty straightforward. First off, it's gotta be an eight millimeter, you know, or 7.92 by 57. The second specification was in case of a malfunction, the rifle should be able to be manually operated similarly to a Mauser. The third requirement was there should be no moving parts um, in the semi-automatic action on the top surface of the gun. So um, in the top surface of the rifle, when you shoot it, there should be no moving exterior parts. Um, everything moving should kind of be uh, interior. Now the fourth and most famous requirement is that there should be no drilling uh, in the barrel, no, you know, no gas tappet system, no piston system, anything like that, no drilling in the barrels, which pretty much just means that you're limited to the, to the bang system. It's not completely uncommon, like for 1938, it's not completely out there. Uh, I mean, the M1 rifle, there's a gas trap version of the M1. So um, thought process may be a little outdated, but not like crazy for the time, maybe. Um, it's definitely not forward thinking at all. And some of those other requirements, like no moving components on the surface, uh, that, that's pretty nuts. I mean, you're, you're probably going to think, well, Walther did it. And that's true. They did do it. It was a bit of a gamble and it paid off for them. Um, but the specifications were the specifications. Now you have Mauser pretty much following everything, you know, as strict as possible. And really the Mauser rifle just shows how crazy strict, how, how just crazy those specifications were and uh, very difficult to produce. And you have Walther just kind of saying, okay, we'll do the, the bank system, kind of already patented that and everything. Um, but we're going to kind of use our own system for this. Quick note about the, the bang system. A lot of people think that it's like bang, you shoot a gun, but it's just a funny coincidence that it's named after a Danish inventor, Soren H. Bang, or it's probably pronounced Bong or something like that. But uh, it's just a funny coincidence that the guy's last name happens to be Bang and he has a gas system for a gun. 
that's just one of those funny little coincidences. Now to the specification that um, the, the gun has to be able to be manually operated in case of failure, um, Walther kind of straight up addressed that with saying, hey, there's a handle here and you just, you know, work the handle. You just work the action. Um, they built a couple redund redundancies into the gun. Um, there's a recuperator under here. There's a spring which returns the, uh, the op rod forward um, after firing. And like they basically said, hey, like if the main spring fails, which you know, at the time the German military, they're, you know, they're just thinking like, oh, if stuff fails, how's it going to work? But um, if, the, if the main spring fails in here, the gun can be manually operated you know, simply by just pushing and pulling this back and forth. The, the lugs are locked in there. It doesn't have really anything to do um, with the spring. So if there were no springs, you could pretty much shoot, pull this back and push it forward and shoot. Um, it would then be a manually operated gun. So that was kind of Walther's response. And, and really it's true. You, you kind of don't need the spring for this gun to work and you could just manually operate it. Now the operating mechanisms of the two guns are really just night and day. Uh, the best way to think about Mauser's G41 is that it's like a semi-automatic bolt action. Um, you know, the Mauser gun it has you know two lugs on the bolt and has a rotating bolt. Uh, whereas the Walther, with their design, they kind of went back to the uh, the Freiburg Schellmann uh, patent of the you know, the flapper locking system. There's other guns like the you know most famously like the the, the DP machine gun that uses the flappers. So you know and guns in between. So it's it's a pretty well proven system by now, the, the flapper locks. And that's what Walther chooses to, uh, to sort of embrace with their designs. I mean, obviously, you know, in hindsight, that's a much better semi-automatic rifle design. It might not be as good as something as we're used to today. It's probably, you know, not as secure or as, as strong as something like an SVT, you know, or the M1's bolt, um, but it was good enough. It, you know, handled the pressure of the G41 just fine. And uh, I mean, ultimately that's what won. So. So now in late 1939, uh, the, the German military is really kind of looking at, you know, these two rifle submissions and they're really caught in a dilemma because you have Mauser and they followed all the specifications and you have Walther that followed some of the specifications. And it's, they're pretty clearly by handling them, looking at them, disassembling them, it's pretty clear that the Walther gun is the, the simpler gun, it's the easier, it's lighter. And then you have Mauser, which is a weird, awkward, bulky, heavy gun, but they followed the rules. So, so High Command is really kind of in this tricky spot where, which one do they award it to? Do they just, you know, even though the Walther gun is the better design, do they just throw it out because it violated the rules? Also, uh, the Walther factory and people that worked there kind of had some connections in the government. So that kind of maybe helped, you know, the, the German military kind of accept, you know, the, the, the rules that they broke. Now, this was a gamble for Walther. I mean, they didn't know if they were going to be disqualified, you know, when they submitted their design because of all the specifications that were ignored. However, during this sort of close, detailed look, you know, in late 1939, um, the German military kind of noted a few things about the two rifle designs. Um, first off, obviously the Walther, like I said before, it's, it's lighter, it's handier, it's less awkward. It also has 35 fewer parts, which is not nothing. 35 parts is a lot. There's 35 fewer parts on the Walther design. Um, it's got a lot more stamped components on Walther's design, which goes towards, you know, making it uh, cheaper, faster to manufacture, um, which is, you know, really important on, you know, scale of economics when they're, when they're trying to make potentially millions of these guns. 35 parts, you know, per gun, a lot cheaper. Those are really big deals when it comes to manufacturing, mass manufacturing. So it was at that time when the Germans went ahead and ordered um, 50 rifles from each company. And then pretty soon, a couple months after they ordered 50, they went ahead and ordered um, 5,000 more. Um, now, if we go forward a little bit to mid-1940, um, after they ordered, you know, all these rifles, they're sort of anticipating you know, the following year, 1941, to be when these rifles are going to be, you know, ready to be mass produced and going to be adopted and everything. So the, the rifles re received the official nomenclature of the uh, Gewehr 41s or the, the G41s. Um, so it was in mid-1940 when the rifles were designated uh, the, the G41. Now we're going to fast forward a little bit to May of 1941. So this is the year, right, when the, the, when the G41 rifle is going to be 
you know, mass produced and issued and sent out to the front lines and everything. This is the anticipated year. And Mauser delivers only 56 rifles. They're only able to put together 56 rifles after all these years because that's just how hard, that's how, how much difficulty they're having in manufacturing their gun. I mean, well, like they're having metallurgic issues, they're having just parts breakages, they're really, you know, fixing stuff. Because there's a difference between, you know, prototyping a gun, making a few by hand, and then getting an assembly line set up and then mass producing a gun that way. You run into completely different issues, um, you know, on a mass produced gun or semi mass produced gun versus like hand fit prototypes. Uh, and that's really what, what Mauser is running into. Also, they, uh, Mauser had to use Walther's bank system on their gun, even though they developed their own bank system to start with. Um, so the, the bank system that you see on G41Ms, that's in fact really Walther's patented um, bank system that they, that they put on theirs. So they're having a little bit of trouble with that. Really, they just had the card stacked against them. But, you know, May 1941, Walther submitted only 400. So it's, it's better. Um, in fact, they submitted another 800 by July of 1941. You know, now that's, what, 1,200 guns by 1941? That's a drop in the bucket, really, and, and, and the, the you know, vast scale of the, the warfare that was going on. Um, but the Walther's design, there's a heck of a lot, heck of a lot more than the Mauser is able to, you know, come up with. And that's just really telling of these, of these two guns by then. Now, Walther is having its own problems at the time, but unlike Mauser, which is having to do with the actual design, um, Walther's limitations are really based around their factory, and they're stretched thin. They're kind of at max capacity already. Um, they're, they're having a lot of trouble with, you know, manpower and just factory space and all that sort of thing. Uh, and in fact, when the, when the SS uh, said that they were interested in the G41, one of the things that they offered was to, um, like, basically give slave labor to the, to the Walther factory to kind of increase their increase their capacity to, to make the SS contract rifles for them. Um, it's a little iffy if the Walther ever did make, you know, specialty SS contract guns for them, but that was something that's documented that the SS offered uh, for, for Walther to, to fix that issue. Now fast forward to June of 1942, um, Walther's only delivered 7,000 of their G41 so far. Um, but the good news is for them that the troop trials, it's been enough time, there's been enough troop trials and evaluations and everything, that the German military pretty much knows what they're going to adopt. And in December of 1942, the German military um, officially adopts Walther's G41 rifle as the G41 rifle. And it was after this, you know, official declaration that um, Walther stopped putting the W on their guns and just put... G41, since they are the official G41. And with the official adoption of the G41, the, the rifle kind of becomes not just Walther's property anymore, but sort of like the government's property. Uh, and they desperately need, you know, guns. So they look to expand productions at another factory. So you have uh, Berlin Lubecker Machine and Fabric, which I'm just gonna call uh, BLM for now on. Um, so the BLM factory at the time, they're producing K98Ks. Um, they did sort of pre-war and up until 1942, they were producing uh, a couple hundred thousand K98Ks. And uh, they completely shut down their K98K manufacturing um, at the end of 1942, just to focus on uh, G41 production. Now BLM didn't produce any actual G41s in 1942, it was, it was too late, but they certainly cranked them out in 1943. Um, which is exactly what this gun is. This is, this is a, a BLM gun, which is marked DUV. Uh, this is made in 1943, which I think all of uh, BLM guns are gonna be marked 43, even the ones that are made or assembled in 1944. The great majority of these um, were made in 19, uh, 1943, and then a few, relative few, were, were you know, made in 1944. Um, but the, the, the main difference between uh, BLM manufacturing these and Walther, um, other than the fact that BLM produced twice as many as Walther, they really cranked them out. They were able to produce twice as many. Of course, they, their factory and everything is dedicated to that now and Walther is not. Um, but BLM was not focused on the R&D of the rifle at all. They're just a contractor. They're just simply manufacturing the guns. They did innovate in like barrel manufacturing and machining and stuff like that. They, they innovated as far as making more guns faster, but they didn't like do any R&D research or anything like that as Walther was doing. So now the total of G41s that were manufactured um, from like 1941 to 1943, 
about 31,000 Walther G41s were made. So the actual Walther G41s are the are the less common of the of the two makers. Uh, BLM from you know early you know from early 1943 to early 1944, they made about 87,000 rifles. So that's a total of about 118,000 uh, G41 or at least Walther's pattern of G41 rifle was made, uh, period, that's it. Now the reason there's only 118,000 G41s manufactured is pretty obvious with hindsight, because of these two guns behind me. Um, now Walther, in as early as 1942, was already experimenting with putting other gas systems on these guns. Um, I mean, the, one of the, the, the main thing that they did, obviously, was put the SVT gas system on it. Some of the early um, sort of G43 prototypes were really just regular G41s, you know, with an SVT gas system on them. Um, you know, they redesigned the, the barrel bands and stuff a little bit. Um, but I mean, it was just as early as 1943, I think the writing was on the wall for Walther. They knew this needed to be changed. They knew that, you know, this bang system is just, you know, pretty terrible. And I'll, I'll give it more credit than it's probably due. The, the bang system is not terrible. Um, it, it's more reliable than I think a lot of people think. Um, now, the, the components of this, the, you know, it's corrosive ammo and everything, but Walther designed the components of this to be corrosion resistant, so, and soldiers were going to be cleaning this and maintaining this. This was a thing in the German military, like, before you went to sleep, you cleaned your gun, so it, it's not expected to be, you know, left corroding for a long period of time after shooting ammo through these. These are going to be regularly maintained and then with the corrosion resistant materials, the corrosion's not a big deal. The main thing, the main Achilles heel of this bang system is cold weather, super cold weather like you find in Russia and Norway. Um, in super cold temperatures, that affects, you know, the gas pressure and just the way firearms work in, in general. And that was causing malfunctions with these guns. In cold climates, these guns were seizing up, freezing up. There wasn't enough gas to work the system. And that was something that, you know, Walther's already trying to work on in, in 1942. A lot of the G41 trials took place in Norway specifically to sort of, you know, test out how the guns worked in the cold. So the, the cold weather is sort of the main, the main Achilles heel of the 41. Other than that, you know, it's, it seems a pretty reliable system. Keep it clean and everything and, you know, right conditions. You, know, you don't see these jamming. You don't hear of uh, people having super unreliable guns. You know, if, if everything's if everything's correct with them. So now, one of the specifications that kind of gets skipped over for these guns is that they're supposed to be, I mean, obviously as many components interchangeable on this as with the standard K98K. Um, stuff like the sling, you know, it needs to take a K98K sling. Um, same K98K cleaning rod. It needs to take the you know the 8498 bayonet, you know the standard bayonet that was issued to troops in World War II. Um, and there's only one. There's one part that is interchangeable on a Walther G41. I think a Mauser II, as on a K98K, and that is this uh, cupped butt plate. Um, this is exactly a K98K cupped butt plate. It's just the same exact piece. Um, so that, that is some parts interchangeability. Um, BLM and Walther, they both contracted out butt plates for them, so they didn't have to make them. Sometimes these will be marked and sometimes not. So now there are some stamped components on a G41, which is, you know, Walther's really thinking ahead by using so many stamped components, you know, that early in the war. Um, but probably the, the best component, I think, to stamp out on this was this, uh, the trigger guard. Such a long, thin piece like this, I think it's really conducive to, to you know, using a stamped sheet metal. Um, but the trigger guard, the magazine, and uh, the follower, these are stamped, as well as uh, the, uh, the, the sling swivel barrel band here. Um, it's really interesting looking at this. It looks a lot like a, uh, a Kriegs model K98K barrel band. It reminds me a lot of it, where it's, uh, it's stamped and it's got a weld line here. Um, it's really interesting. Also, the front band, um, pretty sure that's stamped. But, you know, there's, there's a, a good bit of stamped components on this gun so early, which is, again, fast, cheap, and, uh, you know, easier to manufacture. Fun fact about the Walther G41, um, these things took 2,900 uh, minutes a piece to manufacture, so uh, quite labor-intensive. These also were pretty expensive. Uh, the Germans were paying 
a lot more for these than what the American government was paying for, uh, you know, for, for the M1 rifles. So um, just kind of one of those, yeah, this is what they had. This is the best they could come up with, which is really nuts. Um, the best thing that could have happened to the G41 really is the G43. Um, they up the production, you know, there's over 400,000 G43s produced, and that's really the best legacy of the, of the G41. Um, but as far as modern collecting everything goes, there's just a lot of cool factor of the, the G41. This was one of my bucket list guns that, you know, a few years ago I never really thought I would own, but um, this, is, this is a nice one. This is different than the one you've seen in my previous videos. This is a uh, all original, all matching example. Um, bluing's really nice on it and everything. It's just, it's a really neat gun. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have it. There weren't a whole lot of accessories issued with the 41s. There was a, um, a tool for taking off the uh, taking off the muzzle nut for cleaning. Um, there was a uh, special kind of nose cap that's meant to fit over this just to keep, you know, like water and stuff out of the barrel. Um, but there were no like special loading tools or anything like that. The soldiers just had their standard, you know, ammo pouches that they'd have with their Mauser. And they reloaded this thing with the same, you know, five round Mauser stripper clips. So um, it's pretty easily compatible with, with, you know, any soldier. You could pretty much, if they had a K98K, you could handle this. You don't really have to do much, you know, other than, you know, give them, uh, these were issued with manuals. So you give them a manual or train them or whatever. Um, no really extra equipment needed and they have, you know, semi-automatic rifle now. Thank you guys for watching and commenting like you like you do. I, I appreciate everybody that does that. I read all the comments. So um, thank you so much, everybody, for commenting always. And uh, if you enjoy this stuff, let me know. Uh, your feedback is the only way I know how to improve the channel. So if there's anything you could think of that I can work on, let me know. Um, I appreciate it, guys. I will see you next time.